So you know how there's always this discussion around gaming media as to whether or not one should have to have finished a video game before they put out a review of said video game? I've always been on the side of the argument that considers if you are putting out either an article or a video where the only thing in the title of said article or video is going to be, here is my review of this game or review of this game or just like game name review without any other caveats on it, I feel like at that point, you need to have finished the video game. And if I think back as to why I feel this way, for some reason, my brain always gets reminded of Total Biscuit and the integrity that he brought to a lot of his videos. And I feel like that is potentially one of the main influences whenever it comes to me thinking about, oh, can I type just game name review in the video title of my video because that is going to get more views or do I have to type something else like, oh, here's my thoughts on this game after some hours, or here's my first impressions on this game. And I feel like a big reason as to why I never go the route of, oh, here's my review of this game, despite the fact that I haven't finished it. I think a big portion of that is because of me watching a lot of Total Biscuit content back in the day. But anyway, why am I talking about this in this video? That is because I believe that Baldur's Gate 3 is a prime example as to why you should most definitely finish the games that you review because my opinion has changed drastically since I've done my video and my first video, which was not a review, by the way, but it was an opinion piece after 50 hours. Like the title says something like my thoughts on Baldur's Gate 3 after 50 hours, something like that. And the thumbnail absolutely represents the thoughts that I put out on that video, which was to say that Baldur's Gate 3 is an absolute masterpiece. And I want to make one thing perfectly clear. What I'm going to say in this video changes absolutely nothing of what I said in that video. 50 hours in, the game most definitely felt like an absolute masterpiece. However, now that I've played uh, somewhere north of 140 hours of the game, and I actually finished the game yesterday, my opinions have changed quite a bit. It is actually... Uh, I'm actually shocked at how much my opinion changed on the game. <laughs> which, is, uh, which is weird. It's something that doesn't often happen, but every now and then, you know, every now and then you get uh, confronted by situations and you're just like, how the hell did this happen? How did things change so drastically that I feel so differently about this game than I felt when things got started? Now, before we get into the meat of the video, let me just tell you the first portion of the video is going to be completely spoiler free. And before we jump into spoiler territory, because I do want to get into specifics for people that want to, you know, actually understand where I'm coming from. I'm going to get into specifics, but I will make sure to point it out before we get there so that you can pause the video or leave the video or whatever and all of that jazz. And also, before we begin uh, dissecting why my opinion has changed so drastically, I want to make one thing perfectly clear. I have a deep respect for the team over at Larian Studios. I have a deep respect for the way that they conduct business. I think that they are a studio that I want to see grow they are a studio that I want to support to the best of my ability, but that does not mean that they are above criticism. That Those are just my thoughts. I was extremely happy with the business model that they've implemented for Baldur's Gate 3, which is something quite rare these days, where you just buy the video game and you get the video game. Isn't that, like, absolutely impressive? You know, I, I understand that nowadays this is a concept that for a lot of people are like, well, what do you, what do you mean? Yeah. Exactly. This this is the exception when you can just like buy the video game and have the video game and play the video game and it's a full video game from beginning to end and it feels fantastic, right? So I just want to point that out before we start really going deep into the rabbit hole of what my problems were. And the biggest problem that I have with the game is the story. So this is also important to acknowledge because story is going to vary from person to person. And for a lot of people, from what I've seen in my chat as I've been streaming the game, there's a lot of people that enjoy the story just the way that it is, which is why I'm not saying that like, oh, the story is bad. What I'm trying to tell you is that I don't like 
the story. These are two very different things. I want to make sure people understand this. Saying that a game has a bad story and saying that I don't like the story this game has are two very different things. And I might be wondering, but why? What is it that you don't like about the story? And it's very hard to dive deep into it without, you know, getting into spoiler territory and all of that stuff. But I'm going to try and explain it to the best of my ability. If you've played through Act 1 of Baldur's Gate, hell, even if you've played a decent chunk of Act 2, one of the central themes that Baldur's Gate has, and one of the things that makes me like it so much, and one of the things that made me do... Uh, oh, I closed the thumbnail already, otherwise I would show it. But one of the things that made me show you that thumbnail that said absolute masterpiece was be because of the freedom of choice that I was given along the way every step of the way. I was always given freedom of choice to do whatever I want. It's like, you don't like goblins? Kill them. There's whole quest lines associated with these goblins that you're going to be missing out on, but that is your choice. You don't like goblins? Kill them, murder them, destroy them in any way that you see fit. That is perfectly fine. You do not have to associate yourself with goblins in any way, shape, or form. And I was like, cool, because I don't want to. You don't have to associate yourself with ogres if you don't want to. You don't have to associate yourself with anyone. You can kill anyone in your path that you choose. You're free to make your own moral compass and make the decisions that you want to make throughout the game. And that, to me, was like the biggest thing that I appreciated because like I am role-playing this character. As a matter of fact, if you look at the titles of my playthroughs, which for those of you that don't know, there's full playthrough of Baldur's Gate and you can go back and you can reference some of the things that I'm talking about uh, in this video. Uh, but basically, there's this whole thing about you being free to tackle the game in any way that you see fit. And that allowed me to basically role play what I would consider to be a pretty neutral character. This is a character that, in a way, he's out on his own. Like at the beginning of the game, I was completely, you know, I'm, I'm in this for myself. Like these things have happened at the beginning of the game and I'm trying to make the best of it. And these people that I found along the way, they're my allies for now. We'll see how things flesh out. That's always the way that I try to approach these kinds of games. I'm, I'm neutral. And then, you know, as things happen, I begin judging characters on their merits. So, for instance, everybody knows that there's a character named Listerion. Very early on, I'm like, I don't like this character. I'm not saying that this is a bad character. Understand, as a matter of fact, I think the character of Listerion is genius because it, ma it made me feel a wide range of emotions all throughout his questline, okay? I think the character is genius, but very early on in the game, I'm like, I don't like this character, right? I don't like him. Again, it, it, I know that this is kind of weird for a lot of people to understand, but me not liking him doesn't mean that it's bad, okay? Just to make that perfectly clear. But basically, that's kind of like the way that I get to tackle this game. I get to choose, oh, I like this character, I don't like this character, I like this character, and I get to like the characters that I like, I'll be more inclined to like do things for them and do their quests and try to help them out to the best of my ability. And sometimes I'll succeed, sometimes I'll fail, right? And these are all things that I am ready to accept the consequences of and all of that stuff, but always based around the premise that I have a choice because that is, like I said, the, the main thing that drew me into the game was just the possibilities were almost endless to an extent. And so what happens is by the time you get to the ending of Act 2, again, I'm not going to go into spoiler specifics, but you are presented with a choice, except it is a false choice. There, there really is no choice. There is a choice between a game over screen, which you can consider to be a canon ending to your character to some extent, which I believe they might even consider to be one of their, I don't know, at, at some point I think that in the promotional materials they were saying how many possible endings the game had, like all of the variations and all that thing. I think that one of the one of the endings that I experienced in Act 2, which was presented as a game over, was in fact like one of their canon endings. But basically, you're not really given a choice. You can either hit a game over screen, or you can do something else. And this something else was something that I positively, most definitely, did not want to do under any circumstance whatsoever, and I was forced to do it by the game. As a matter of fact, this all goes back to a central theme around this game, which I'm hesitant to talk about in the spoiler-free section of this video, but there's a central theme around the game, almost in a way, let's put it like um, in Star Wars terms, there's a struggle between the dark side and the light side, right? 
there's the dark side and there's the light side and you, my character like i said is kind of neutral going right down the middle well at the end you are forced to make a decision where it kind of like leads you down the dark side a little bit not too much a little bit leads you just a little bit to do some questionable things that you're like i would never do this right and throughout your path all the way up until then you're kind of given these choices which can pull you further towards the dark side or further towards the light side and every time those choices were presented to me i would always go i'm not interested in the dark side i'm not super interested in the light side either I'm just straddling that line. But basically, whenever they would give me this temptation of gaining more power by accessing the dark side, so to speak, I'd always be like, no thanks, I'm good. All that jazz. And then in the in, in, at the end of Act 2 is when they just like, nope, embrace the dark side or game over. And I was like, when that happened, I was like, I don't, I don't like where this is going. So pretty much at the ending of Act 2, the story just kind of like started sucking for me. But I was like, okay, let's just, you know, play along for now and maybe we'll get to fix this at some point later in the game. And the worst part was, which is what I discovered yesterday, was that uh, as I got to the ending of Act 3... The actions that I wanted to take at the ending of Act 2, which would lead to a game over screen in Act 2, actually made way more sense with the events that occurred in Act 3. And wh what does that mean? That means that the choices that I made in Act 2 initially that led to that game over should have been valid. Like from a logical, canonical standpoint, due to the way that the story is presented to the player. And that was tremendous. Like that to me, I was like, it was like a, a slap in the face. It's like, yep, you did this because we wanted you to do this this way. And you can either take it or leave it. But again, when it comes to story, it is one of those situations where it it's going to be different from person to person. A lot of people have no problem embracing the dark side. A lot of the people are like, yeah, let's let's do it. Dark side all the way. And that's cool. It, it's great that you can enjoy that. And it's fantastic. I didn't like it. And those were the story problems. Those were not the only problems, but that is the crux of the issue. Because when it comes to me, when I started playing this game, right, after my first 50 hours, I was already playing out, oh man, I want to do a cleric character, which I'm going to make it him as a runesmith, and then I want to do a barbarian character, which is going to be like a, a Warhammer troll slayer themed character. Like, I had all of these characters that I wanted to do and go through the story with them and make different choices and do all of these different things, right? Because the bard is the character that allowed me, because bard was my first character, he's the character that kind of allowed me to straddle that line, right, in neutrality and be able to influence dialogue choices and all of these things, right? Whereas when it comes to all of these other characters, they were going to be wildly different. And I was super excited to jump into those characters. I am not kidding when I tell you that after finishing the game yesterday, because of the twists and turns that the story has, I have no desire to play through the game again in the near future. I still will at some point, I'm pretty sure. I will because I didn't do the Dark Urge playthrough. I did a normal playthrough, so I want to see the Dark Urge playthrough as well. But, you know, the things that I've experienced up until the end of Act 3 have made me basically not really want to play the game again. And again, I still think it's a fantastic game. Don't get me wrong. But story-wise, that's as much as I can tell you without jumping into spoilers. Now, other problems that I have with the game, because uh, story is not the only thing. Act 3 is chuck full of glitches. It has a lot of problems. And I believe that potentially in my playthrough, uh, it was harmed due to the fact that I started playing the game before they applied any patch. Like I started playing day one, and then I continued playing through the game after they applied patch one. And I think that my save file being both pre-patch and post-patch has caused a lot of problems in the game. Because I've heard from a lot of people where they're like, I didn't experience half the bugs that you're experiencing, but they could clearly see the bugs that were happening in my screen at any given time, which was not really fantastic. Like, there's just a bunch of characters that don't react appropriately to what is happening to you. 
To give an idea, I had one of my major allies at some point in the game show up in one of those, you know how when you try to rob something from someone, right? So I'm actually to, to add insult to injury, this was actually the climax quest of this character. Okay, so this is a character that I have no control over, but it is a character that I was doing a quest for them. It is an important ally for my party. It is somebody that I saved earlier in Act 2, and it is a major character in the game, like a super important character. And so I'm in this big encounter around this character, okay? And this whole encounter takes place because of this character. It is a very challenging encounter because this is a very powerful character. And I believe one of the reasons why the encounter is challenging is because that character is very powerful and that character is meant to help you throughout the encounter. Except what happened was, as I was doing the encounter, the character just sat there and did nothing. Actually, zero. No joke. It might as well have been T-posing. It wasn't, but it might as well have been T-posing. So this character just sits there, does nothing, and here's what happens. When I finish you know, dispatching the encounter, brutally killing all of the enemies, and basically securing the safety of this character forever. What happens is the character still sitting there, gives me no dialogue options whatsoever, and then I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to start looting up the place. And then I go, and you know how when you're trying to steal stuff, right, there will be the, 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 the chests and the display cases and whatnot, they'll show up as red because you're trying to steal stuff, right? And usually when you try to do that, there might be other characters there that'll be like, Hey, what are you doing? You're trying to steal things, right? And you have to like talk your way out of trouble and all of this stuff. So when I start looting this place, the character that did nothing throughout the whole fight, the big main character, the, the climax of this character's quest, that character shows up and says, Hey, why are you trying to steal things from all these people that were trying to kill me? So that is like brutally immersion breaking and that's just like one example uh if i was to go through my through my streams which i don't want to because i don't i don't think i need to but if i was to go through my streams i could find like at least 20 30 50 other examples of things that basically make no logical sense whatsoever basically act three is kind of busted in a lot of ways uh i don't know if it needed more time because larian studios is saying that they didn't need more time and that's why they pushed the game forward to me i think they could have most definitely benefited from more time there's also other situations like one of the one of the recent situations that i saw was for instance that was an encounter that i was in where there were a bunch of enemies and you go into the encounter and you talk to the enemies and then the enemies go ha ha now we all fight right and then they set up the the encounter so what happened was, because I already knew that was going to be a fight, because I died and the first time that I went through the encounter, I knew it was going to be a fight, so I start the fight. You start the fight, you get a couple of turns in, and then suddenly, I don't know, three, four turns into the fight, the NPC goes, ha ha, I'm going to reset everything, and we're going to start over, because now we're starting the fight proper, and he starts with the dialogue options as if we had just met again, and I was like... <sighs> Either do it at the beginning, or don't do it at all, but like, after we begin fighting, and this character just acts as if we just got there, it just doesn't make sense. Again, completely immersion breaking, and there's a bunch of that stuff in Act 3, which again, I believe that, in part, it might be caused due to the fact that my save file was present before the game was patched, and after the game was patched, which means that if you play the whole game through before patch 1, it was probably less buggy. If you play the whole game through after patch one, it was also probably less buggy. But if you were caught in the middle, like I was, you're probably going to have a bad time. Which kind of sucks, because it means there's probably going to be a lot of save files of people that are going to be glitched out. There are also characters that quite simply did not acknowledge the situations that were happening in Act 3. As a matter of fact, I feel like Gale, which is a wizard character that you uh, get very early on in the game... It almost felt like he never left Act 1 because of the dialogue options that were presented to me when it came to talking to him. Or maybe midway through Act 2, I don't know. But it basically felt like he was still stuck much further behind in time than the point that my characters were actually in. It just quite simply didn't make sense 
the way that he was reacting to a lot of the things I was reacting. Then there's also this list that is in the game, which I'm not going to show you because non-spoilers and all that. There's this list in the game that will tell you all of the allies that you've been able to gather to your cause, which is important to when you get to the end of the game. As you can imagine, like gathering allies for one big final confrontation, right? But as it's telling me all of the allies that I've gathered to my cause, it is giving me all of these entries like, ah, this person uh, has joined our party, is super motivated because, you know, he likes you or something like that, right? And I would have entries that would say, let's say, for instance, character X, just because I don't want to give spoilers. But let's say character X. It would say character X is super motivated by your actions and they will join you on any fight that you encounter uh, in the future. And then like one or two lines below it, it would say, we have killed character X, they will not help us in the future. And I was like, well, which one is it? And I know that there's people that are saying like, well, it's just the order. Because some people told me, oh, I see that as the order in which events happen. It's like, no, 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 no. Because there are characters that I've never killed. There are characters that I've never tried to kill. There are characters that I, all I've done is help them along the way. And they've pledged to be my friends and help me throughout all of my struggles. Right? Why is there an entry saying that I killed those characters? I never did. That was just something that the game would tell me. It was like, oh yeah, you killed this character. There was also a character that died very early on in the game, like all the way up in Act 1. Okay, this character died. It was an accident. Some people will know which character I'm talking about. Basically, that character wrote me a letter in Act 3. And I was like, what? You died. In Act 1, as a matter of fact, not only you died, your corpse kept dragging itself along. Th that was the other thing, which I thought was maybe like a joke or something. But this character died, and because he died in my camp, I could not get rid of his corpse. His corpse would follow me everywhere, because as you know, the camp changes depending on which location you're at. Your camp structure kind of changes. And the corpse of this character would always be there in every single camp that I would go to. And you guys are like, well, maybe you should have got... I did! I, I got one of my other characters, pick it up, and put it in a box. So that the corpse would stop spot... It would always be there, every single time. And then suddenly in Act 3, the corpse disappears, and the character leaves me a letter saying, Ah, I have to go do these things, but I'll be sure to come back to help you in the end. And I was like... This is crazy. So yeah, lots of bugs. Uh, and this is pretty much as much as I'm going to talk about. I guess there's one more point, which is some of these scenarios in Act 3 also felt potentially a little bit unfair. And what do I mean by unfair? So I'm someone who likes going into situations when it comes to this game and avoid saves coming at all costs as much as I possibly can. I've talked about this in my saves come video. I'm not saying that you shouldn't do it, I want to make that perfectly clear. If you want the safe, if that is the fun way for you to play the game, do it. Do it to your heart's content. Enjoy the game. It's your game. You bought it. You paid for it. You shouldn't listen to what anybody says on the internet regarding a video game that you paid for in regards to how you enjoy that game, so long as you're not cheating in multiplayer. Because if you're cheating in multiplayer, screw you. You're a piece of trash. I hate you. But besides that very specific case, if you are just like enjoying a video game, it's single player video game enjoying enjoy it however the hell you want that that to me doesn't make a difference but me the way that i play these games the way that i like to play them is i like to jump in and i like to you know go into these scenarios and accept the outcomes of the scenarios and what do i say when i mean that certain scenarios don't feel fair it's the type of scenarios that you would jump into and there's almost no chance of you surviving without prior knowledge of what is happening in that scenario and I felt like that sucked, you know, because like you're sitting there and you're going like, yeah, here we go. We're going to play the game. It's going to be a ton of fun. And I want to accept my consequences. Then you jump into a scenario where the chances of you winning are very, very low. Now, look, I also understand the, there needs to be a certain level of challenge. I mean, I'm no I'm no stranger to challenge. I love challenging games. I think they're fantastic. But I feel like if I want to challenge myself, I'll go play. I'll go play on tactician, which I was playing on balanced. And there were just certain scenarios that didn't feel particularly fair. But that's kind of like a, a minor thing. It doesn't bother me too much. It's just like, when you put it all together, that is why, at this point, my mind has changed. Now, does that mean that I would not recommend Baldur's Gate 3? No. I still think Baldur's Gate 3 is a fantastic game. 
I think that if you enjoy these types of games, most likely you're going to enjoy it. I think that if you're on the fence, I would actually recommend you to wait a couple of months because I would like to see them iron out quite a few things, namely the bugs, because I'm assuming that the story itself is not going to change that much. So, so long as they can fix the bugs, I still think it's a fantastic game. I'm still happy that I've played through it and I got to see it all the way. But yeah, I didn't enjoy the story. So anyways, now I feel like it's time for us to get a little bit more specific. We're going to be jumping into spoiler territory at this point. So if you don't want to get spoiled, if you haven't played through the entirety of Act 3 yet, you might want to take a step back, go play the game, and then come back when you're done so that you can listen to the rest of this video. Thank you all for watching. Like button, subscribe, bell notification icon, all of that stuff. And we're going to be jumping into spoilers. Now, let's talk about the things that I most definitely did not like about the story. See, when it comes to Baldur's Gate 3, I feel like the intention that the team had from the beginning was for you to enjoy the potential of using illith illithid powers, which are like the, the mind flayers and all of that stuff, to be able to use illithid powers as a regular Dungeons & Dragons character. I feel like that was the whole intent behind it. And there's no way that you're going to convince me otherwise because there's absolutely no reward whatsoever to you not using illithid powers, which is something that I that I thought, because it's kind of like implied in the way that the narrator tells you whenever there's a chance for you to get a new illithid power, the narrator kind of goes, oh, you can give in to the illithid a little bit and you can become more powerful. Great power comes and all of this stuff, right? And the way that your dream visitor is constantly trying to tell you, like, oh, you should use more illithid powers. You should most definitely get more illithid power things. And that is actually something where I was like, oh, I'm, I'm sure there's there's got to be a payoff because the game keeps kind of like teasing me to go down this path of using illithid powers. So I very early on made the conscious decision that I would not use my illithid powers. There's there's like one situation where I use my illithid powers and it's because I was essentially forced to if I wanted to keep my cover, which is when you have to like torture some goblins um, in Moonrise Towers. And I was like, I mean, they're goblins. I don't give a damn anyway, so I might as well kill them using these illithid powers. Who cares? That was the one time that I used illithid powers, other than the one where you're kind of like forced to use illithid powers to free Shadowheart early on in the game. But besides those two situations where I was kind of like forced into it, never used it, never claimed any tadpoles, never used any of that. I, I mean, I'd show you guys my stash. It's like chuck full, the, the, the camp stash. I was like, I don't know, friggin... 20 tadpoles or some bullshit like that because I used none of them. I did nothing with illithid powers. And it definitely feels like that was not the intended way to play the game because there's no reward whatsoever for not using the illithid powers. There's no additional options that are given to you by not using the illithid powers. There's nothing. There's just disadvantage. It's like, well, you're just less powerful. That's it. The game is just a little bit more challenging for you because you're not using illithid powers. Which, I don't even mind the game being less challenging. I would, I mean, more challenging because I'm not using lithid powers. What I do mind is that there's no acknowledgement of that. The game does not acknowledge the fact that I did not go down the dark side and use lithid powers. But, whatever. It's not a big deal. Uh, the whole lithid thing, it just feels like that was the intended way. It, it feels like the whole game is designed for you to sympathize with the ploy of Mind Flayers. Now me, with my character, I killed all the goblins because I don't negotiate with goblins. What do you think that says about Mind Flayers? You think I'm going to negotiate with Mind Flayers? I literally killed a whole camp of goblins. I killed more goblins in this game than I think almost in any other game I've played. And I brutally killed them. I killed so many of them. I actually, I went back to places where I didn't even have to go to clear the world of the goblin menace. I destroyed every single goblin I could find because I do not negotiate with goblins. So, I ask you again, what do you think that tells you when we jump into the ending of Act 2? Because here's what happens at the ending of Act 2. Those of you who don't care about spoilers, in case you might not be aware, at the ending of Act 2, you are put in a position where uh, things are going bad and you're about to become a Mind Flayer yourself. So, you jump into the situation and you're presented with a situation where there's a Mind Flayer 
who has apparently been living inside this, let's call it an astral pocket. He's been living inside this astral pocket and he's been protecting you. This is true. The Mind Flayer has indeed been protecting you for his own reasons, but he has been protecting you. So this Mind Flayer has been protecting you throughout the whole playthrough and he's been preventing you from transforming into a Mind Flayer. And so what happens is there is somebody else inside the crystal, a Gith Yankee. And because of what I had found throughout the game, I kind of knew who the person was that was inside the crystal. And so I'm like, well, I want to save the person that's inside this crystal. I want to save them because they can probably help me prevent the situation that I have. Because, you know, you have a tadpole in your brain, you're going to become a mind flare at any moment. And supposedly this person has the power to stop that. And so I'm like, I'm going to kill the mind flare that's been protecting me in order to potentially gain the favor of the person who's inside this crystal because I'm not going to trust the Mind Flayer. I'm not going to... So I killed him. The second you kill the Mind Flayer, boom, game over. You get a game over screen. There's a cutscene that plays out and your character transforms into a Mind Flayer and that was one of the canon endings that I was talking about. And so, even though they give you the choice of what you can do there really isn't a choice because the choice is between, well, you can experience this game over now or you can help the Mind Flayer contain the person who he's, in, he's basically like drawing power from, contain this person inside this place so that he can keep protecting you. And now you guys are like, okay, Rurikan, so, you know, that kind of sucked, sure. But you also said earlier in the video that it doesn't make sense from a story perspective. What do you mean? Well, at the very end, before the final boss, you are once again presented with a choice if you've played the game properly. I mean, not properly, but if you've made certain choices along the way. So I made the choice to go into Raphael's house, steal the Orphic Hammer, beat the shit out of Raphael on the way out, which was a fantastic fight, by the way. The Raphael fight, amazing. Had an absolute blast playing through that. As a matter of fact, the, Ra the, the House of Hope, the Raphael encounter is potentially some of the best content in the game. Love that. That was fantastic. Loved it. Fantastic. More of that. So I went to Raphael's house, stole the Orphic Hammer in order to be able to free Prince Orpheus from the prism when the opportunity was given to me. And so what happens when you are once again pulled back into the prism? Because at the end of the game, you're pulled back into the prism, the, the pocket dimension where the Mind Flayer is and the other character is. So I grab the Orphic Hammer and I start releasing uh, Prince Orpheus. The Emperor, who, what is, which is the name of the Mind Flayer who's been helping you out, instantly says, okay, if that's the way it's going to be, I'm leaving. Fuck you. You don't have my protection anymore. And then I free Prince Orpheus and somehow I don't die. So what is implied at the end of Act 2 is if you try to free Prince Orpheus, you're instantly going to become a Mind Flayer and you're going to die because the Emperor can't protect you against the Elder Brain. That is what is implied. But it doesn't make any sense because at the ending of Act 2, the barrier around Prince Orpheus is about to shatter. The only reason the barrier is restored is because you kill Prince Orpheus' honor guard. That's the only reason the Mind Flayer is able to restore the, the orb around Prince Orpheus and continue to protect you. Which means that essentially if you kill the Emperor, Prince Orpheus is able to jump out of the orb. And you can have the same dialogue with him that you would have had at the end of Act 3. So, quite simply, you instantly becoming a Mind Flayer. One of the two is correct, which is either you can talk to Prince Orpheus in Act 2 from a story standpoint, and that makes sense. Or you can't talk to Prince Orpheus at the end of Act 3 because that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Because basically when you smash the, the first stone, Orpheus is not free, Emperor pieces out, not protecting you anymore, yet somehow you don't magically turn into a Mind Flayer. So the inconsistency there was just too much for me to handle. And then basically at the ending of Act 3... This was the thing that really pissed me off and completely made me, like, 
anybody who was watching the stream will realize that at that point I didn't even want to play the game anymore. That's that's how bad the story got to me because like I was deeply invested in the story of Baldur's Gate 3 like de despite what happened at act 2 I was still deeply invested in the story of the game I was still deeply looking forward to tackling the challenges that were going to come but the choice that is provided to you to me was a completely impossible choice which is like one of you is going to become a mind flayer and I was like what the fuck do you mean that's it one of you is going to become a mind flayer and the choice given to me was like, you can either have Prince Orpheus be a, night, uh, a mind flayer. And I'm like, so you mean the leader of the race of Githyanki that are fighting the mind flayers in space, protecting everyone, the true rightful leader of those people, have him become a mind flayer. Doesn't seem very reasonable somehow, condemning this whole race to becoming leaderless, because Vlakith is a false leader at the end of the day, right? Condemning them to becoming leaderless, denying them their true prince, the prince of the comet, whatever you want to call him. Because, you know, somebody has to become a mind flayer. I was like, well, I don't want to condemn the Githyanki race. Option number two, Karlak. I'm like, oh, my love interest. Yes, indeed. Let me go ahead and condemn my love interest to become a mind flayer. And I know that people are going to say, well, it's logical. She's going to die anyway. It's like, so if, because she's going to die, does that mean that you get to just do whatever the fuck you want with them? Guess what? I'm probably going to die hopefully 40 years from now, give or take. Uh, does that mean that you get to do whatever the fuck you want with me? Like, how does that work? At what age cut off? The, it's like, I'm not going to sacrifice my loved one you know, again, role play. I'm not going to sacrifice my loved one to become a mind flayer because, you know, she's going to die. I don't think that's cool. But anyways, so what is the other option? You. You become a mind flayer. And I was like, well, fuck. That, that really wasn't even an option. To me, personally, the way that I role play this character, that wasn't even an option. That was just like, well, guess I'm going to be a mind flayer. So I get transported into a, transformed into a mind flare, and I was like, well, this fucking sucks. I don't like anything about this. Uh, I like I, I just lost all will because it wasn't even my character anymore. You know, I tend to get attached to my characters in video games because like, oh, I like this character, the theme around the, the way that I role played, and particularly in a game that I get so invested in the story as Baldur's Gate 3. And to be giving such a terrible choice, wherein my character has to choose between condemning the leader of another race, condemning his loved one, or condemning himself, I fucking hated that. I was like, I hate this. I hated it in Act 2 when I was forced to aid a Mind Flayer, and I hated it in Act 3 where I was forced to essentially become a Mind Flayer because from a roleplay perspective, there was nowhere else for my character to go. So I basically played through the rest of the game as a Mind Flayer, which was absolutely miserable. I hated it. And then when we finally get to the end, the only thing that gave me a little bit of redemption was the fact that, hey, at the very least, they allowed my character to fucking kill himself. Because it's exactly what I did. And that's exactly, like I was actually saying, right as the final cutscene's playing out, is like, please give me the option to off myself right here on this pier in Baldur's Gate. I'm just gonna stab myself in the chest, please. And they gave me that at least. And when, <laughs> when you finish the game, <laughs> When you finish a game and you're <laughs> the only thing you want to do is die. <laughs> I don't know. Which is again why I say that like I feel like for a lot of people this story might work. I feel like they actually might enjoy it. I feel like, you know, I think it's um subjective. Different people are going to enjoy different things. Doesn't work for me at all. Don't like it at all, and pretty much stopped liking it at the end of Act Two where my character was forced to aid um, a Mind Flayer, and there was no other choice given to me whatsoever. So, that is where it comes to the uh, story stuff and why I don't, I, I didn't like it. Uh, but then when it comes to specifics about glitches, uh, the character that I was talking about and the culmination of her quest line was Dame Aelin. Dame Aelin, during the culmination of her quest line, when you go to the Sorcerer's Sundries at the top of the tower and you fight Laroican, Dame Aelin did fuck all the whole fight. She was just standing there doing nothing. She wasn't paralyzed. She wasn't, like, under some sorcery. 
Nothing happened to her. She simply didn't contribute at all. Just stood there, did nothing. And then after I killed Leroican, uh, I was trying to loot things. And when I'm trying to loot something, Dame Aelin shows up and is like, it seems you were caught doing something you're not supposed to. It's like, what the fuck? What the fuck do you mean, game? Is Dame Aelin going to snitch on me after I killed all these people for her? Is that what's happening? She's gonna she's gonna snitch on me that I'm like stealing stuff from her? Like, come on, that that's, just, that's just completely unreasonable. And then when it comes to some of the unfair scenarios, uh, the one that I would instantly bring up would be the Iron Throne. I don't think there's any way that you get to that scenario with like the standard party you're playing with, and you're ready to do that scenario. There's no way you're you're meant to get there and then reload. And then reload and potentially change your party composition, re-ready their spells. And I just don't think that's necessarily a good approach to scenarios. I think that's a, a great approach if you're doing tactician. Don't get me wrong. If you're doing tactician, I think shit like that is to be expected. But if you're playing on balanced difficulty, really going to throw something like that at me and just be like, hey, it is what it is. So, but yeah, I, I was able to, to do it. Like, I, I think I did one or two reloads there. Not because I wanted to save all of the gnomes but because I needed that to understand exactly how to operate that scenario, which is why I just felt like that wasn't a fantastic scenario. And there's a couple of more, but I don't want to like dissect the whole thing. Although I will also say that was a hilarious thing that happened at the ending of Act 3, which I might even do a short of it, maybe at some point. But basically I got to kill Lord Gortax while making him dance on top of grenades. See, that's the dichotomy of the whole thing. Even though there's a lot of problems with the game, it still gives you a ton of freedom. Hell, I made the aspect of Ball dance, even though they didn't make a dance animation for him, which was very sad. Which You, you see this girl here on screen, there's a point in the game where she transforms into this big demon. And I put a spell on that demon that would make him dance, but he just kind of like waves his head around like he's dizzy. And I was like, no, I want to see a dance animation on the ball spawn. I want to see it. Just like you guys made Gortash dance on top of grenades, I want to see the ball spawn dance. But anyway, uh, it was unfortunate. It is what it is. Uh, I just wanted to put this video out uh, so that people understand where I stand now that I've finished the game. I still greatly appreciate what I've experienced of it. Like I said, I have a deep respect of Larian Studios. I'd be very curious to see uh, the improvements that they bring to Baldur's Gate 3 because at some point I want to do a Dark Urge playthrough, which we will probably also stream. Like, I'm going to wait for a time where there's less video games coming out and all that because, good God, the month of August was insane. Like, this train that's going on... That's going by right now. You guys are probably hearing in the microphone. That was the month of August. There was a train and I was like in the tracks and it just like ran right through me. Like, that was August. Ran right through me. Okay. But anyways, that's going to be it for this video. It's already way longer than I initially intended, but I wanted to give everyone my, uh, my currently updated take on Baldur's Gate 3. And this would be what I would consider my review now that I've finished the game proper. And I've seen pretty much everything it has to offer. I mean, I haven't seen everything, everything, but, you know, I've done my full playthrough and I think that that's pretty much where I stand. Anyways, I'll be happy to see what you guys type out in the comment section. Just keep in mind, like I said, even though I didn't like the story, that doesn't mean I think it's a bad story. It just means I didn't like it. And I also feel like there are definitely some plot holes there. And I think that that is, that does make parts of the story at least somewhat bad. Like the fact that you can only talk to Prince Orpheus in Act 3 and you can't talk to him in Act 3 is just, in Act 2 is just completely fucking arbitrary and makes absolutely no sense. But anyways, those are my thoughts on Baldur's Gate 3. Thank you all very much for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one. Stay strong, stay safe. Peace out.